Interventional Structural Cardiologist. He's the Director of the Cardiac Cath Lab at Advocates of Suburban and Associate Pro um, Program Director of Interventional Cardiology at Advocate Christ, which is right down the street here, right? Exactly. Uh, he is a member of AMG, Advocate Medical Group. He went to medical school at Liaquat. Did I say that right? Liaquat. That's okay. <laughs> Very close. Okay. <laughs> Back How do you in say Pakistan. It? How, okay. How do Li you say Liaquat. Liaquat. Yes. There you go. You can learn Pakistan. Yes. <laughs> um, internship at Jinnah. Jinnah Medical College. Jinnah Medical College. Residency at Advocate Christ Medical Center. Fellowship at St. Vincent's Med Medical Center. Indianapolis. Indiana. Indiana. He's been all over. That means he's very well versed, right? Thank you. <laughs> Residency at Liakut. Liakut also. Yeah. And Before coming here. Again, fellowship at Advocate Christ Medical Center. He's board certified in cardiology. Cardiology, interventional cardiology, nuclear cardiology. Many, many. He spent CD and geography. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. And he is affiliated with all of the Southland um, hospitals. So that's Christ, South Sub, and Trinity. Trinity. And very soon, a Payless Hospital. I was just going to say, where's that Payless? <laughs> very soon, very soon very over there. Very soon, the And um, most everybody here has very interest in atrial fib. So sure. From what I understand, there's lots of good questions that are going to be asked. No and there are also people virtually, just so you know. Oh, great. It's a high Perfect. program. Perfect. So, so kind of and everybody help yourself. Dr. Donnie uh, was able to get us some treats over here. So heart healthy, fruit, vegetables. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So thanks for an nice introduction, uh, Susan. Uh, so how many of you have atrial fibrillation? Three. Or how many of your family members have a fibrillation? You know? Okay, quite a few. So, so basically, as you know, that the atrial fibrillation is an irregular heartbeat. And nowadays, uh, we have uh, many options. Uh, and the options include uh, the blood thinner medications, probably. How many of you are on the blood thinner medications? Wow. How do you like it, by the way? It's expensive. Well, you probably don't have a choice. <laughs> we'll talk about that, OK? So nowadays, we have uh, another treatment option that I'll go over with you in a few minutes, OK? So what we call is a non-valvular atrial fibrillation stroke, basically, and the current treatment options, OK? And in the middle of anywhere in the lecture, if you guys have any questions, just interrupt me and we'll, don't worry about my thought process, I'll catch it again. <clears throat> As you know, that's the atrial fibrillation is an independent risk factor for the stroke. And it's the old data, but uh, we know that almost 6 million people in the US have atrial fibrillation. And by 2030, it's gonna get doubled, maybe more than doubled, okay? Whenever the patient who develop irregular heartbeat, what we call the irregular heartbeat, the atrial fibrillation, okay, in layman terminology, is that irregular heartbeat, atrial fibrillation. Whenever somebody develops irregular heartbeat, they are at risk of a stroke. They have a, like a 5% more increased risk of stroke. One in six, one in six patients who will have atrial fibrillation they will develop a stroke if they are not being prevented. And the two times greater likelihood of a stroke recurrence in atrial fibrillation within six months if they are not treated. So, sorry about that. As all we know that if somebody, probably your loved one you have seen, I have seen so many who have developed a stroke, it's very, very debilitating. It can give you so many things which affects you. It is a number one cause of disability. It is a higher, 1.5 times higher disability, two times higher mortality. 70% of death occurs 
uh, or death or permanent disability. Now, if it happens, it can give you all kinds of neurological impairment, including visual impairment, cognitive deficits, means patients start losing the mind, develop dementia, losing memory. People develop a lot of depression because once they develop a stroke, they can be mobile, so they go into depression. Social disability. And if they have a full blend stroke, they develop what you call, they cannot speak. It's called the aphasia. They cannot walk. Either they have a mild damage or severe damage, what you call the hemiporosis, means the weakness of the part of the body. It affects the neurological area of the brain where they cannot control the urine, they will develop a bladder incontinence. And sometimes the severe stroke, you have seen that people, they walk with a cane or walker. And employed post-stroke, you know, after once you get a stroke, God forbid, uh, people, it's very hard to find the point. Very devastating. So the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Rhythm Society, they started giving the guidelines to people who develop the uh, who have developed atrial fibrillation, how to prevent the stroke. And based on that, we calculated the score risk, and it's called the Chats West score. When you guys come to us or any patient come with atrial fibrillation, we see we calculate that chat sweats restore based on their current clinical condition and what the factors they have. And we put and then calculate the numbers. And then the, once the number reaches into the two or more in the men or three or greater than in females, we recommend that they should be on a blood pressure medication period to prevent the blood clot which can flip into the brain in the stroke. If you have a vest score, the score is one in the men and two in the females, there is a controversy, but still we would like, now there are more practices towards gearing, develop, giving them blood thinner medication. And if patients have a the score of zero and zero, basically they what you call the lone AFib, which you don't have any reason for it, they're okay with the no blood thinner medication and just aspirin until they reach that state, age of 65. So here, so what will we do when we, when, whenever we calculate the stroke risk, we're way against the bleed. Because when somebody's on the blood thinner medication, they're at risk of bleed. Particularly when we grow older, we have a risk of fall. We fell down. Sometimes it's spontaneous bleeding inside the belly, inside the brain. Sometimes the people excessively bruise. So we've calculated the risk versus benefits over here. And if somebody who, if you can see over here, yellow stripe, if somebody who has a chest rest risk of score, we calculate is a three, for example, person A, their annual risk of stroke is 3.2% means they are at high risk of developing a blood a clot and then develop a stroke. And if, if the number goes high, the risk of a stroke goes high too. Now, if you put this, when we calculate another score, which is called the HES blade, means the risk of developing a bleeding when they are on blood thinner medication. And we calculate that one, if somebody of HES blade score of four, they have an annual person bleeding risk is 8.9%, which is a lot. So that's a way we calculate whenever somebody comes and see us. We sit down with them, we calculate all the risk, we give them all the numbers and options and discuss with them that how to prevent a stroke. The goal, the, the basic idea in a patient with irregular heartbeat is to prevent a stroke. Period. And if you look at it, it's a bleeding risk. It's not just like a straight line that one time patients start getting it and they're flat line. If you go year by year, when we grow older and older, there's a compounding risk 
and it goes higher and higher. As you can see that, if somebody has a has blood score of four, we calculate that, etc. And then a year to year time, you will be 8.9% risk of heavy bleeding. But at the age of 75, by the time it turns 85, look at the bleeding risk, 60%. Phenomenal, huh? Two. We don't want that. Nobody wants to have bleeding. And not only the nowadays, as you saw that, uh, how many of you are taking water from it? Nobody probably. Yeah, nowadays we, warfarin is not a first line treatment for as a blood pressure medication. One can answer some other reason. Most of the people out there are either Eliquis or Zoralta. How many of you are Eliquis? Yeah, most, most of them. Zoralto, anybody? No. So there are a couple of medications, what you call the newer anticoagulation agent, because it has a better compliance, better uh, uh, safety profile uh, as compared to warfarin, because warfarin, what you call it, a pain gas. I mean, if you take it, you have to go to the monitor blood count, you have a, a dietary restrictions, you have a drug interaction, but having said that, it's a dirt cheap medication as compared to the a liquid source Toronto, which at times through be a lot expensive. So that's what called the newer oral anticoagulation agents, or we call the DOX, basically based on our own terminology, direct oral anticoagulation agent. But the better fact is that even though we think that we give them a liquid source Toronto, they will be very well compliant. But that's not the case. It's still, Almost 40% of the patients who are supposed to get Eliquis or Zorato, they're not taking their medication. So, means they are keeping themselves at a risk of stroke. So, if you see that those are the newer blood thinner medication and the loss of warfarin, <laughs> nowadays we are using most of the time. The Epic Seven, which is called the Eliquis, the Rexel brand is a Zoralto and the Warfarin. And as you can see that, study after study have shown that despite giving the medication, they have a discontinuation rate of 24%, 25%, Warfarin 75, 70 to 35%. And then if you look at the major bleeding, if they are on this medication, with Epic Seven is 2.1% is the most, the least of them. Or yeah, and, uh, and that's a band. We don't very rarely prescribe the people nowadays this one. But the Zoral, uh, the uh, warfarin, 3.5, 3.1 to 3.4 percent, and uh, with the Zoral to 3.6 percent. So still, the reason they basically don't want to take the medication because of the risk of bleeding. And here is the one. This is an area of the heart. I call it is an area of the tongue in the heart. It's called the left atrial appendage. It's a reservoir of the blood. Got it created for reason. But when patients develop irregular heartbeat, this is a most notorious area in the body because people develop the blood clot in that area. And you can see this round structure. This is the patient who had developed a blood clot and it's ready to fire and goes somewhere in the body. And where really the which place, the first place it goes is into the brain. Mm. May go everywhere else too. But this is the area, just remember, it's called the left atrial appendage. 90% of people who are not taking a blood thinner medication, that's the area that people develop blood clot. And that's the area we focus on when we talk about what the other options we have. So let's talk about that. What other treatment options we would have? For example, you or you. If you don't want to take a blood thinner medication, is there any other uh, option we have? And indeed, yes. The journey started 2002, 
almost 20 years ago. Then people start thinking about it. That, okay, what we can do to help those people who cannot take the blood pressure medication, is there any way we can plug or close this area of the heart for the left atrial appendage? Welcome. Left atrial appendage. So the people who are not taking blood pressure medication, they don't develop blood clot in that area. So the watchman was the initial device which was started that journey in 2002. And then trials after trials after trials after trials. And finally, it got FDA approved in 2015. That patients who cannot take a blood thinner medication for one reason or another, which we're going to go up, uh, into detail in a few minutes, they are the candidate for this watchman left atrial appendage closure device. And nowadays we are, we just, uh, we are in the champion atrial fibrillation trial. We are part of this trial. The Christ Hospital is one of the Illinois hospitals. There are only 20 few that we were part of this champion atrial fibrillation trial where the patients who are de novo, what you call who all comers who are taking a blood thinner medication, we enroll them in a trial to compare them with the blood thinner medication against the watchman. This trial went so fast, they needed only three and 3,000 people. It's a global trial. And just, I got the newsletter about a week ago, they are almost at uh, completion of this uh, trial. Because this is like so robust. So it's a watchman. So we have, we started our journey way back. 2015 FDA approved it. So that, that was the first generation of the watchman. Now we are in the second generation of the watchman called the watchman flex. And the reason we use this watchman flex now because of the safety. It is very soft. Okay, does not do too much trauma if it happens, God forbid, to the appendage because the left atrial appendage is a very thin wall structure. Anything we manipulate in that area has a risk of bleeding or perforation. So, with this device nowadays, what we have, it is very, very atraumatic. The risk of perforation from this device is less than 1%, very safe. Yes? So what if somebody had the first, the first watchman? Yes. Is it gonna be changed? No, change no, them? once, okay, so once somebody has a watchman, they go through the, what you call the pharmacological medical regimen for six months. And then once the six months over, it's completely endothelialized, means it's part of the body. Okay. It's done. They are done. They, they don't need any more blood thinner medication. In fact, nowadays the FDA has approved just recently, about less than a month ago, that now if somebody has a watchman, they would don't need we don't need to put them on the blood thinner medication anymore. We just put them on aspirin tablets. There's a new indication now. So let me see if I get this straight. We're talking about the people who have these problems. We have medication which thins the blood. Yes. However, that could lead to other bleeding problems. Yes. So there's a there's a point where you have to balance that. Yes. Of course, everybody's different. Yes. So you're talking about the watchman does away with the need for the medication, but still keeps the blood clotting balance. Yes. So what happened is that if somebody is on the blood thinner medication, the risk of a stroke doesn't go zero percent. It goes to less than one percent or two percent. Okay. If we if we put somebody on watchman and they don't take a blood thinner medication, the risk of stroke is also going less to than the one to two percent. So it's an equivalent to having a medication. But you are not taking a medication, so you are less likely to do it. 
Understand the point? Yeah. Right, yes. Is the left atrial appendage the only area where blood clots develop? Ninety percent of the time. Ten percent of the time, it can develop somewhere else, but very, very unlikely because the area, the the area in the heart is a that's the area where people do develop. Other area of the heart, very unlikely to develop. Should we be on? Did you say you continue on aspirin to yes. prevent that? Yes. So once they complete their medical regimen for six months, they are on lifelong baby aspirin, which is not good. Can you still get that? It's like you have a pacemaker? Yes, definitely. Pacemaker does not have to do anything with that. In fact, we have a lot of people who have a pacemaker who have been delicate through it. I'll show you in a minute. Any other questions? So, if you look at it, it's like a little bit older slide, 2019, over 11,000 patients years of follow up, over 100,000 have implanted worldwide. And if you can see that, the relative risk reduction of the disability stroke compared to warfarin 55%, bleeding compared to warfarin 72% less. Relative risk reduction on all cause mortality means that dying from the bleeding, stroke, et cetera, 20% or less. Okay. And this one is a, like a small cartoon. You can see that's a catheter coming into the groin, to the area of the heart. It's like a flex ball. We are making it. And this is a watchman device. I'll show. I think that there is another cartoon here. Are there any side effects from this device? In the, in what sense? Side effects that would make me not. No. <laughs> no. 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 Okay. So so people, it's a rare instance that we ask that you know, it's made of nitinol. If somebody has a severe severe nitinol allergy. I mean, natural energy is very, very common. You can, from the earrings, from the navel, from the uh, bracelets, et cetera, et cetera. If somebody has a real, because you put stents in all the patients, and the stents made of nitinol, we haven't seen any reaction. If somebody has a very, very severe allergic reaction to nitinol, we usually send them to the allergic immunologist to counteract it, and then after that, we treat them. But I haven't seen person in. Otherwise, there's no side effect for a device per se itself, except for the procedure complications can happen. You think that this device can embolize? Means that we put it in and you say, oops, it pops out. I haven't seen personally by myself because we go through all the, what you call the pass criteria before we release this device in the body. And any period of time we think that this device is not see it, we don't put it. We take it up. So only I haven't seen a patient, luckily so far, that had a device embolization or had a device problem. So what would be a contraindication to having that? You just said that um, ever we see you that it would not be. There is no contraindication of the people with the device until this patient is wanted. Or which they want to go through the procedure or taking a risk. Yes, sir. Yes, outside of the allergy and the dislodging possibility, those small that you talked about, those two things, the allergy and dislodging, does the body to any significant amount otherwise try to reject it? No, I haven't seen anything. So that's the reason when we put it as a first generation and now second generation device and they have studied so much. That's the reason they want to put them initially the first six weeks of blood thinner medication to prevent the blood clot development on this device. And now recently after putting so many devices, now we know that they studied everything and the risk of developing a blood clot on this device is less than 0.7%. So if we approve that, okay, people, once they have this device in, you don't want to. Uh, put them on a blood thinner medication. Is, is there case reports? 
where people have developed a blood clot on the device and had a stroke? Yes, there are cases of those. So if I'm a pharmaceutical guy, yes, I don't like this, right? Yeah. Means that you, you don't like the device? <laughs> okay, <laughs> your choice. It's just the no. opposite. No, That's the choice. He's talking about. Uh, no, no, no. Medication. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Medication, right? <laughs> Eloquence is a fortune. Eloquence is a fortune. It costs a fortune, even on insurance. Yes. So you're going to put this device in, and then people don't have to have that. <coughs> what what don't people don't have to have. Have, have, have a, uh, yes. Yes. But the, yes. He's not a pharmacist. No, 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 no. But, 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 but no, no. <laughs> it's a very, very good question. We do get the patients who are taking the blood thinner medication and we get commonly that, okay, it's very, very expensive and we cannot afford it, okay? Is it, this is an indication? Yes, this is a, one of the indications for this device. But it's kind of like a little bit softer side of the indication. Uh, because we try to do all alternatives. We said, okay, you are not candidate for Eliquis, how about Zeralto? Is Zeralco is cheaper? Is like, oh no, Zeralco is very expensive. Okay, how about the warfarin? I don't want to take a warfarin because uh, it's kind of like a red poison for us. I have a patient that red poison for us is too much bleeding problem. We have to go and check out pro time. Our levels are goes up and down, blood thinner medication. So then, yes, we make the case and then the insurance company then approves it. So far, I don't have any rejection uh, because we see all those patients in our practice that they have a, they, they cannot take the blood thinner medication for one reason or another. If there is a reason that they cannot take it, we offer them. But if they can continue to take it and we cannot make a case, we ask them, okay, why don't you continue? That's the one that when the champion atrial fibrillation trial I was talking about, once this is complete, the results come out from this one, positive in favor of Watchmen, everybody, then his door is open. Then everybody has a choice. Yes? Why can't they remove the left atrial fibrillation? When or when? Why? 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 Okay. Why don't they? Okay, so it's a very good question. To remove the left atrial fibrillation, you need to go to open heart surgery. Okay? So what we have done in the patients that who are going for open heart surgery for one reason or another, and they are known to have an irregular heartbeat, we ask the surgeon when they do open heart surgery, they collect the left atrial appendage. So they do? They do. Okay. They do. Having said that, the studies have shown that, that even though they do clip the surgical, the left atrial appendage, it's still the residual of 30% of the appendage left over. And then we have a 30% of the appendix left over this risk of blood clot. Here in this watchman, no leftover appendage is completely seen. What's the reason for the LAA? What is it? What does it do in the heart? Okay, that's why I told you the first thing. God created for a reason. It's a blood reservoir for us. Hmm. It, it just has an extra amount of blood that a person needs. That's all it is. It's a very small structure. Or that extra oomph? Yes. Like if you did the Chicago Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Little bit extra black for reason. You cannot question God. Why did you do that? Yes. Is the left atrial appendage perhaps some sort of developmental evolutionary leftover, like appendix or something yeah. like that? Or is you can call that. It's a vestigial organ. Yeah. It's like appendix when the surgeon goes in. When surgeon goes in to open the uh, belly, they come out with a hey, the appendix is gone. Yeah. So that's what I was she was asking that I cannot surgically the surgeons do remove if we ask them. Yes. It step you don't have to take the blood thinners. Does it stop the AFib? No. So AFib has the two components. The irregular heartbeat, which can control with the medicine, or nowadays they do ablation and they get back to the normal heartbeat and to prevent a stroke. 
there are two components of it. So this one we are talking about only the blood thinner medication side, not the taking care of irregular heartbeat. If somebody has an irregular heartbeat, they will have a regular heartbeat throughout their life. Yes, ma'am. Um, my brother has a of when taking COVID. Yes. And he's 84 years old. Is that a good a candidate for your... Okay, so so the people... So I let me go through this one a little bit quickly because I can give you... Sorry, I'm been like very good. Uh, because I can give you an idea that which patients are the candidates. Which one is that they approved? Indications for it, okay? And then I can answer your question from, please pardon me for that one, okay? So we talked about that. We talked, we saw that one. So this one, one of those studies where they study the, the, the new device called the Watchman Flex device. They enrolled like a 400 patient at 29 sites of the United States. And the patients who are taking uh, new anticoagulation agent plus aspirin for 45 days. Then we switched them to Plavix plus aspirin for six months and now aspirin dependent days. That was a trial. But as, as I told you, now FDA has bypassed this part completely. Now we can go straight to this part. And you can see that those studies has a primary safety endpoint and primary efficacy endpoint, secondary efficacy endpoint, which includes Patient has an all cause death, ischemic stroke, or systemic embolization means the, the popping out of the, of the plug. Okay. Or they have a significant flow around the, the device, which makes them the risk of the stroke. They all measure with this. And then you can see that the baseline demographics are female, 35%, majority of them were in the age between. You see that 73 plus minus 8.6. So you can calculate they are 80 years of age and above in less than 60 years also. Depends on what their clinical profile is. When we calculate that stroke risk with the chance West score. People have a previous stroke, diabetes, the bleeding is score, major bleeding or predisposition to bleeding 33%. And then you can see that the implant success year after year, year after year, started from 90.9% to all the way to 99%. So chance is only 1% that we were not able to implant a device. And the reason behind is that that God has created everybody differently. Not five fingers are alike. They're not even. So it's the area of the thumb where we put the plug in is different size and different shapes for everybody. It's not one plug fits all. It's everybody is different. So when it comes in, we call them, we categorize them as a broccoli shape, chicken wing shape, socks shape. Recently, I found that, okay, it's, it's, it's a, what you call octopus shape. So there are different shapes it comes into and different sizes. So we have a variety of the sizes of those devices. So if the device is, or if the watch, if, if the area of the plug, where we call the left ventral appendage is too small, we cannot put the plug in because of risk of perforation. If that area, where we put the plug in is too big that our device cannot fit in. We cannot leave this one in because it's going to pop off. Yes? Can you tell if the size will be appropriate from like an echocardiogram? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So initially, initially it was a prerequisite that every patient who is going through the watchman procedure has to go through a test called the TEE esophageal echocardiogram or CTA of the appendage to see the size and shape and everything. In my clinical practice, since I've started it, we started doing initially, but we found that 
the chance that people will not get this device when we go in is a less than 1%. So we stop doing it. Why put a subject for two procedure while we can find out on the day of the procedure? So yes, answer to your question. Yes, we can do that. And uh, at times we have done a TEE uh, pre-procedure and we said we are, it might not be a good candidate like I'm doing a procedure. And then when we go in and we do the angiogram on those patients of the, of the area where we want to put it, we will surprise that, okay, this area is so big that we can put it in. So yes, uh, there are a lot of centers, they're still doing it. My associates, they do it, but most of them are now changing their practice and now they are not doing it because putting a subject to have another procedure. Uh, okay, so those are the like a different sizes of the device of this watchman, 20 millimeter, 24, 27, 31, 35 millimeter. And you can see the majority of the patients, they fit in between 24 to 31 devices. There are some bigger ones. If you look at the primary safety endpoint, 0.5% rest only. And then you look at the death, not forbid. I mean, everybody can, you know, whoever goes to procedure, even for the minor procedure, if someone tells you the risk rate is lying, there's no single procedure in the world is risk free, even for the death, not forbid. In this procedure, if in this trial, the cause of death, I mean, all cause death, zero percent means out of 400, none of the patient died. Develop ischemic stroke, like a patient who developed a blood clot on the on the on the plug, only 0.5%. That's why I was talking about that DNA change that's really there. Chest that it popped out and went somewhere, none. Or device or procedure related events requiring emergency surgery or major and any intervention, zero percent. So pretty much all safe, very safe kind of procedure. Yes, listen, while I always tell them, it's taking risk versus benefits. When you take the risk for something, there's a one to 2% chance of having a complication, but majority of the patient has a successful procedure. And as you can see that throughout the course, all the studies have shown that, that the risk of complications with the watchmen or safety events 1.2%, 2.2, 1.4, 1.5, with the watchman flex is 0.5%. So 99.5%. That is a risk rate. I call it 1% because I don't want to make 0.5%. You know. And then you can see the procedure success rate has been going up and up over the period of time. And the anatomical closure is higher and higher. And then you can see that the people who are, who, once you put the device on, majority of them, they stayed for Epixaban. And uh, majority of the patients, once they got the device in, 96% of them were uh, off the anticoagulation. But this is, as I said, that it's a 2019 data, but now, I think so it will be out of question. People are not going to use it. Why, why use it? I mean, I have patients who are like a severe bleeder. They, uh, they bleed so much, then the purpose gets defeated if you put the plug in and put them in the blood for the medication, but there's a risk of like a small little stroke. So we can just, I have a patient, we put them on, they come back to the hospital and bleeding is stopped. But that was an off level. Now we have FD in our tool. So now, which patients are appropriate patients? Which patients are candidate for the watching? Let's go away. Patient, first of all, we define them, they don't have an irregular heartbeat from the valve disorder. 
we do the echocardiogram, make sure that they don't have the in America, in the United States, majority of the patient has a non-valvular AFib. Usually the valvular AFib is more in the countries where I came from, Southeast, uh, Pakistan, India, Malaysia, from that area. Because their reason for developing irregular heart rate because of the rheumatic fever is prevalent. Here we don't have rheumatic fever. Second, patient has increased risk of stroke and recommended for oral anticoagulation. Means that we calculate the, the score, the first slide I showed you. And then we calculate that the score, we said, yes, this patient is a candidate for oral anticoagulation. Patient is suitable for short-term anticoagulation therapy, but deemed not able to take for long-term after six months. But this one is now with deleted. Patient has an appropriate rationale to seek a non-pharmacological alternative to intercoagulation. Means that basically we're talking about the top knowledge. Okay, so now let's go. This one is a CMS criteria. I'm not going to go over that one. Because, but the only thing they need to be make because Big Daddy is watching us, that we are not doing anything irrational. So you want to make sure that we fulfill all the CMS criteria to make sure the patient is appropriate to you. Can't do that if something unethical. We have to do, we have to practice ethical medicine. Okay, so now let's see which patients. Patient who has a history of bleeding inside the brain called the intracranial bleed. where the benefits of the left atrial pediculosia outweighs the rest. Means that once they have a bleeding inside the brain, if they're taking blood and medication, they are at risk of subsequent bleeding in the brain. So if they get the plug, they are off the blood and medication. History of a spontaneous bleeding other than intracranial means that the patient who will develop GI bleed, which is more common than intracranial bleed, they keep coming back with a low blood count requiring blood transfusion. That's another category. Documented poor compliance with the blood thinner medication. As I told you, there are almost 40% of patients who are supposed to take the blood thinner medication that are not taking it. So they are at risk of the stroke. So that's called the poor compliance. If they are poor compliant, they are candidate for the blood. Intolerance of warfarin and or no, actually, caught, we talked about it. High risk of recurrent falls, particularly I see a lot of those patients. Like they are 85, 87, 90 years of age. Uh, they have underlying, unfortunately, uh, dementia. They forget to take their medication. They fall so frequently, they have to interrupt the blood thinner medication or they start bleeding. Those, that's another indication <coughs> of the patient that who, how much time I have, by the way? We're, we're good. We're good. Okay. Library closes at nine. So oh, okay, we're okay. by then, we'll be good. <laughs> That's fine. I would never want to take too much of time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, patient with a cognitive impairment like the Baker, like Reds, dementia, they cannot take the medication. They forgot to take the medication. Family members are concerned. Another candidate. Severe renal failure is not there yet. I mean, this is like very soft indication. Occupational related to high bleeding risk, the fork operators, high uh, lift operators, bus drivers, train pilots, sometimes those are people who are activated at times. Uh, need for prolonged uh, dual antiplatelet agents. People nowadays, we see them. A lot of people, they have underlying coronary artery disease. When they go for the procedure, they need aspirin and Plavix or aspirin and Proventa. And on top of it, they receive the blood thinner medication. They are high risk of bleeding. That's a one of the indications for it. Uh, increased risk of, uh, sorry, increased bleeding risk not reflected by has blood score. For example, of patient who has a severe low platelet count, they are risk of bleeding because of the low platelet count. They have got for cancer. They have a cirrhosis of liver. Uh, in other situations where anticoagulation is not appropriate, do deemed 
uh, discussed by the, all the physicians in the hematologists, oncologists, the primary doctor, everybody on the same page that yes, patient XYZ, he cannot take a blood pressure medication, then those patients would be uh, an appropriate candidate. So I told you drug interactions, bleeders, future bleeders, non compliant, and lifestyle and occupation. Now, economics a little bit. Everybody worries about the dollars and cents, isn't it? So, Medicare covered, commercial and federal covered, almost 119 million. If you look at the the, the initial cost of the procedure is high, but over the period of time, if somebody's taking the blood thinner medication, it offsets completely. Even this one is better than the blood thinner medication. So here I have a patient which I did uh, recently. Patient 77 years old, male with history of atrial fibrillation on the blood thinner medication. <coughs> in recurrent GIP, garden variety patient, what we see for this kind of procedure. Hypertension, diabetes, the calculated risk is four, which reflects into 3.9% into the risk of having a, having a stroke in uh, at one year. So this is the area where I told you that this is a probe coming to the, it is done on the general anesthesia, by the way. It is done on the general anesthesia, if the outpatient procedure means that it will come as an outpatient and stay overnight, go home next day. If we go to the groin, if you look at the brochure, I think the brochure, yeah. Here, if you can see that one, this here is a bottom part of the leg. In the top part of the coming from the neck, so usually come from the from the leg all the way up, and then go across the area of the heart where we want to see where is this small area called appendage. And then my partner, one of my associates, he's he or she is doing a PEE to look for the area also, and I'm doing I'm coming across. And I'm doing the angiogram. To, this is a left atrial appendage. You see that? The correct is a size of thumb, probably. So once we we inject into that area, and after that we put the plug in, we want to make sure that we pull it. What you call the tug pads. Really, what you pull it, we want to make sure it doesn't come out. And once it doesn't come out, then we release the device. This looks like this. A small strawberry in the heart. How long does the procedure take? Uh, usually, we keep the operating room uh, for two hours, but most of the patients we finish by my part because patient can come to the room, get intubated, blah blah blah, prep it, everything. But for me, usually we take almost half hour to forty five minutes just for the procedure. People, family just go for the coffee, drinks, or lunch, and they come back with that. And then you can see that on a TE, this area, the appendage, I'm so sorry. That's okay, you're okay. <laughs> it's appendage, and then after put the plug in, it's get completely sealed. So again, repeating that, which patients are candidate? History of bleeding or increased bleeding risk, history of recurrent falls, patient are non compliant not taking the medication they're supposed to take, inability or difficulty maintaining therapeutic range means that patient are warfaring and the levels are going way thick, way thin, changing of the medication all the time. Patient are intolerant to warfarin or aliquis or zoralto, one reason or another. Patient has another risk involved, occupation lifestyle. Um, patient who are had a stent, they are on the aspirin plavis, aspirin brolinda. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question. Given what you said about that, uh, you know, it's like a outpatient status, overnight stay, you're going into the groin. 
terms of like recovery or patient expectation, is this really considered non-invasive surgery? Minimally invasive, I call it. Okay. I call it minimally invasive because we go through the groin area, uh -huh. tubes go through up there, and 99% of the time I put the plug in in the groin. So they don't have to lay down in the bed for hours and hours. They just, by the time they go into their room, they're extubated. Within two hours, they're having their lunch or dinner. But, but a patient's recovery sounds like it's even quicker than like saying having a, a going in for the appendectomy. Sure, of course. There's no incision, nothing. There is no even, a, even a non incision. Yes, 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 very quick. We will do develop like a bruise around that area because patient when we put them uh, the when we when we put our hardware in the body we keep we want to keep the blood in all the time so they don't have a blood clot. So when the tubes come out, they turn their see that they will develop like a black bruise, brown bruise. Uh, but usually this bruise faded in a couple of weeks like so. Yes, kind of like an ablation. Procedure. Yes, you can say ablation kind of procedure, you can say angiogram kind of procedure. For us, yeah, everything goes in our field through the groin. You can call it the same kind of procedure. Yes. So if someone has ablation, it's still candy Yes. Yes. So ablation, as I told her, ablation takes care of the irregular uh, heartbeat of the heart, but it does not take care of the risk of. Bleeding. or no risk of a stroke so it does not take away that until unless they are very young like in their 50s then they're like their score is so low that they don't need it yes ma'am my brother had an ablation in february at yes. the age of 78 yes and he had three surgeries for bleeding before that Oh, what kind of bleeding? Um, internal from oh. um, the colon. Yeah. So, um, since he had this uh, watch when he was doing great, and he um, had a massive heart attack about 10 years ago where he was resuscitated four times. So, we didn't think he was going to make it. But um, after this watchman, he's, he's uh, going to be 79 next month. He's doing great. So, 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 Yes, ma'am. How long does the device last? Say it again, I'm so sorry. How long does the device last? How long? Per minute. Once in the body, it's in the body. So if you were to live like another 50 years, it wouldn't? It, as I told, uh, I think uh, your question, that after six months, the, the blood thinner medication regimen we give is kind of like somebody who is a stent. Any, anybody has a yes. standard yes. arm? Yeah, you got the stand. So they gave you a medication for like a six months or a year. And, yeah. So 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 basically the medication is for to polish the 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 the, the plug over the period of time. And what we call is endothelial means that it becomes the layer developed on the top of the device and becomes eventually part of your body. The only difference is that. The area where they go in is completely sealed, it's gone. Yes, ma'am. If you have microbial prolapse with moderate regurgitation, but you did not have organic fever, are you eligible for that? Yes. The, the non valvular AFib in this country is mainly related to mitral stenosis, this basic narrowing of the lab, not the deep field. Any other questions? So the ages you can receive this up until infinity and early. We years. have a patient I put in like a hundred years old. Functional. I mean, yeah. you know, if I had to decide, not the family, and nothing. Somebody is lying in the bed, nursing home, 
not doing anything, I would not, you know, typically I cannot, but somebody is very functional. And you can receive it as early as 20 years old, 18 years it, old? No, no, no. It all categorized depends on the risk stroke uh, based on our calculation. We calculate those numbers for us, and then we decide. And you're on Plavix for six months? Yes, and aspirin and Plavix for six months, and after that, just aspirin only. 81 or 81. 81. 81. Well, for Pinkovich, when he has an ablation and it's corrected the aphid, um, they still always have a risk of. Yes. Is it because once you have AFib? Once you have AFib after a certain age, okay. it'll be a 100% risk. So I suppose the baseline right now, the cutoff for us, I didn't put the, uh, I think so I may have it. Continue. No, I don't have a, uh, but I can, so basically here, so Chad's VASP score, what we call it, to calculate the risk. C stands for congestive heart failure. H stands for hypertension. A stage, A stands for age, okay? And it gets two, two points. Diabetes, S stands for sex female sex, where V scores for vascular disease, okay? So all those things, basically initially, when they start calculating those figures, those numbers, they were used to use just only Chad's score. But they found out that this part is also missing because those patients are also a higher risk of having a stroke. So they now incorporate that one into that scoring point system. So age is 65 and above. 65 is minimum we need. Uh, for example, if for example, somebody is age of 55, that's a well, but he has a congestive heart failure. He has a high blood pressure. He has a diabetes. So already, he has three points. And if he's a bleeder, GI bleeder, for example, it's automatic. Yes? Now, say a patient had that, or instead he had a TIA, that would also probably boost their score quite a bit, and they're still candidate for the... Yes, so it's S here, here S stands for the sex, here S, which is scored two points, scores for the stroke, or TIA. Okay. So anybody who has a TIA or stroke documented, they got two points. So if somebody has a two points of a stroke, one point for high blood pressure and one point for diabetes is four points automatically. Means that automatically even in a safe flat, those patients need a blood thinner medication. If they don't want to choose to take the blood thinner medication, then they are appropriate, they meet appropriate criteria for the watchman or plug, I call it, then they are qualified for that. Having said that, we are going to wait for this trial, which is going to complete probably next month or two, and then once the results are available for that trial, that will tell us that are those patients who are not as a commercial candidate for Watchmen, are they a candidate for the Watchmen or not? This trial is going to answer that question for us. Yes, sir. How long does a stent stay in your body? Forever. 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 Once it in, it's in. I just want Yes. It doesn't go anywhere. Yes, sir. When if you have an irregular heartbeat, but it's not a stent? Yes. Do you still have a risk for? No. No. So, so it's a fit. It's fit. Okay. There are, there are different kinds of irregular heartbeat. <laughs> We are talking about just atrial fibrillation. If suppose for irregular heartbeat, another blood thinner medication indication for irregular heartbeat is called the atrial flutter, for example. The atrial flutter is not indication. They have 
we have to have a documentation for it. Like example, the other day I was referred by my uh, one of the referral physician. He sent me a patient and then I keep looking at it and keep digging into the chart. I went all the way 10 years to find out that we had any documentation of irregular heart rate. Now, I told the family that it unfortunately came out. Yes. So somebody already has uh, yeah. miles go. Could they still be could they still be utilized? Yes, because here the stroke two points. Yeah. High blood pressure, definitely a lot of patients with the stroke, they have a high blood pressure. One point or three points already. So they need so so they qualify. First, you need to have them qualified for the blood thermification before we consider them to be watchful. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I know a person who had experience like this and he had blood thinner. He's had a mild stroke. So they need to be on blood thinner until unless they have an issue with the blood thinner medication. Anything else I can answer for you guys? Is plunder the same thing as a different? Different. 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 But the treatment is essentially the same. Right. That's what I thought. We all good? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have somebody already asking for your card. Did you, uh, did you bring I, any with you? I did not. I 